We're going to take a few minutes in our service now to remember Christ around his table. It's a time for Christians once again to remember Jesus and who he is and what he did in their place at the cross. And in just a few minutes, we're going to be taking a small wafer and a bit of juice. And we need to remember that these are symbols. These are symbols of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, which were offered at the cross in place of everybody who had put their trust in him. It's very important this morning that we remember Christ rightly. And so to do that, we're going to be looking at a passage that will show us the benefit of Christ's sinless life. So if you have a Bible with you, would you turn to 1 Corinthians 15? We're going to be looking at verses 20 through 22 together. Some men are coming down the aisles with some Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, simply raise your hand, we'll get one to you. If you don't actually own a Bible, consider this as our gift to you so that you can begin reading God's Word for yourself. Uh, the topic in 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection. And Paul starts the chapter by declaring the reality of Christ's resurrection. And you see that in verses 3 and 4. And then in verses 5 through 8, Paul lists a list of witnesses who can bear witness and give testimony of that resurrection. But it's clear in verse 12 that there were some in Corinth who doubted that people in general are raised from the dead. And Paul goes on to explain the futility of the Christian faith if nobody is raised from the dead. You see that in verse 17. Paul writes that our faith is worthless and we're still dead in our sins. And then in verse 18, that those who have died in Christ, those believers who have died in Christ, perish. They have perished. Well, our passage today is going to confront that lie, and it's going to confront it in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's read our passage, and as we do, I want us to notice two things in verses 21 and 22. We want to notice the consequence of Adam, and then we also want to know the, notice the consequence of Christ, starting in verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death... By a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So in verse 20, Paul again restates Christ's resurrection from the dead. It's a known fact. It's beyond discussion. It happened. But his resurrection is not just a hard, cold, sterile fact. Notice at the end of verse 21 that Christ is the first fruits of those who have died. That means that Christ holds a position of headship. He holds a position of authority in the resurrection. And if there's one in the resurrection who holds a position of head in that, then there will be others who are in the resurrection who are under that headship. And that's all believers. So there's hope in that. And we're going to see the details of that in verses 21 and 22 at the end of those two verses. But first we want to look at the beginning of verses 21 and verses 22, in order to see the consequence of Adam. We see that by a man came death in verse 21. And then we see in verse 22 that in Adam all die. And we know this, uh, death entered the world through Adam and because of Adam and his fall in the garden, his fall into sin. Everybody who has identity with Adam, that is all of us, all of us who have descended from Adam, we had die. We die spiritually and we die physically. What we did was we inherited from Adam a spiritual death, one that made us a slave to our sin, one that made us uh, heap up one after another offense and sin against the God who created us and enables us in all things. And we did that in perfect alignment with our own will. And that's the bad news. And because of that, we are due judgment because of our sin. But we see the consequence of Christ at the end of verses 21 and 22. And this is so encouraging for the believer. We read that by a man came the resurrection of the dead. There is a resurrection of the dead, and that comes by a man, and that man is Christ. At the end of verse 22, we read that in Christ, all will be made alive. So everyone who has identity, everyone who is in Christ, will be made alive. And this alive here is not a reference to salvation because it's talking about those who are already in Christ. This is a reference to a resurrection in which a person will be given a powerful, imperishable, sinless body that lives forever, that's beyond the reach of death. 
This is getting pretty encouraging. Christ's resurrection from the dead secures a resurrection for those who are in Christ, for those who are in him. And this is possible because Christ was raised from the dead. So what we want to do this morning as we remember Christ is consider why it was that Christ himself was raised from the dead. And to do that, I want to read a verse from Romans 1. It's Romans 1, verse 4. And this describes the reason why the Father was pleased to raise Christ from the dead. Romans 1, 4 says, Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. What this tells us is that the Father was satisfied Father was pleased with Christ to raise him from the dead. Christ had suffered on the cross. He bore in his own body the sins of everybody who would trust in him. He satisfied the Father's wrath against all of those sins on the cross in just a matter of a few hours. And then he declared emphatically, it is finished. The work that he accomplished to satisfy the Father's wrath against everybody who would put their trust in him was finished. And Jesus entered into death as the sinless Savior. The Father sees him in death. He sees him conquering death and the sin that was the cause of that death. And he was pleased to raise him from the dead because he looked at and he saw a sinless Savior. So it's on the basis of the Father's pleasure with the Son that he raised him from the dead. And that's what we want to remember about Jesus today, that he was the Son of God who was without sin. And on that basis, he was raised from the dead so that the believer himself could have resurrection into eternal life. This gives us hope that there is an eternity for the believer, that they will spend eternity worshiping God forever in his glory. So believer, if you're here today, this morning, and you claim Christ as your Savior and your Lord, take this opportunity to remember him for who he is, to thank him for the work that he performed in your place at the cross, that as the sinless Savior, he entered into death, and because of that, he was raised by the Father unto new life that enables your resurrection in one day in the future. If you're here today and you're not a follower of Christ, we need to know one thing. We're very, very thankful you're here. It's our joy and our privilege that you're here with us this morning. But you need to understand that there is another resurrection, a resurrection for the unbeliever that's coming. It's one that we want you to do everything you can to avoid, and there is one way and only one way you can avoid that resurrection. It's a resurrection unto judgment for eternity. The way to avoid that is to pursue Christ and to deny yourself and turn to Christ and recognize that he and he alone is the one who can save you from your sin. So as the men come forward and they distribute the elements, just take the elements and pass them to the person next to you. But use this time as a time to think carefully about who Christ is and his claims and that he and he alone can save you from your sin. After the service, there will be someone up here to my right and to your left, and they will be happy to visit with you and talk with you about what it means to know Christ. But for the rest of you, uh, when your hearts are prepared, take the elements on your own, and I will come and close our time in prayer in just a few minutes.